Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today's session called Integrating Climate Action and Biodiversity Conservation into a Blueprint for a Livable Planet. My name is Justin Winters. I'm the co-founder and executive director of One Earth, a philanthropic organization working to accelerate on the ground action to stay below 1.5 degrees C. I'm thrilled to be back at Bioneers. Um, it is such an honor to be here and I wanted to give a big shout out to the staff and leadership of Bioneers for making this possible. I know we all miss being together as a community in person, um, but we are gonna do our best today to engage online on Zoom, which at this point, everybody's pretty used to. Um, as you all know, and you've been living through, it's a tenuous time in the global community as we are battling COVID-19, while also facing a worsening climate crisis. As many of you know, the planet has already reached an average temperature rise of 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And we're seeing the enormous impact of this all around us. But the truth is, and the good news is, that groundbreaking science tells us that we can still solve this. We need to do three main things. We need to shift to 100% renewable energy, protect and restore 50% of the world's lands and oceans, and we need to shift to regenerative agriculture. Here today, we're gonna focus on that second key solution, protecting nature, specifically why we need to protect and restore 50% of the world's land to solve the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss and how to make that happen on the ground with a focus on upholding and strengthening indigenous land rights. And we're also going to do a deep dive on the science behind the global safety net, an effort two years in development that is the first comprehensive global scale analysis of terrestrial areas essential for biodiversity and climate resilience, totaling 50.4% of the Earth's land. With me today is an incredible group of people from organizations with a wide array of expertise and experience. We have Carly Vinn, strategic partner at Resolve. Carly is an co-author and central partner on the Global Safety Net paper that was published in Science Advances in early September. We also have my colleague, Carl Burkhart, managing director of One Earth and also a co-author of the GSN paper he also led the development of the GSN interactive data tool with Google Earth, which he'll walk us through in a bit. And then we have with us Oscar Soria, a brilliant international campaign director at Avaz, who has worked on climate and biodiversity issues for a long time and works closely with indigenous groups around the world. And finally, we are grateful and deeply honored to have Ang Angela Kashuyana, a prominent indigenous leader from Brazil, who's dedicated her life to securing rights for indigenous peoples. Before I hand it off to Car Carly and Carl to go more in depth about the global safety net, I'd love to share with you all a short video which gives a brief overview on the effort. If we could play that video now, that would be great. Nature is key to rebalancing our global climate system and ensuring a vibrant future for all. Ecosystems absorb carbon from the atmosphere and produce the essentials for life on our planet. Fresh water, clean air, and healthy soil. Intact natural lands also help to prevent viral outbreaks like COVID-19. Tragically, in the past 50 years, we've lost half of our natural land, destroying two thirds of all living creatures on Earth. We must reverse the damage, and we can, by creating the Global Safety Net, a network of land areas that are vital for nature and humanity. The Global Safety Net is the first comprehensive estimate of the total land area requiring protection to solve the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. There are six main layers that make up the Global Safety Net. First, are areas already protected by governments, totaling 15% of the planet's land. Second, are species rarity sites. These are additional areas that need to be protected immediately before rare animals and plants are lost forever. Third are high biodiversity areas, groupings of plants and animals that are vital to maintaining our ecosystems. Fourth are large mammal landscapes, like the Pantanal wetlands of Western Brazil, home to the world's largest jaguars. Fifth are areas with a large extent of intact wilderness, continuous forests, shrublands, and grasslands. Sixth are land areas that provide additional carbon absorption and storage, helping to stabilize our global climate system. The Global Safety Net also incorporates an analysis of potential wildlife corridors, areas of degraded land that can be restored to connect ecosystems back together, allowing nature to be more resilient as the Earth warms. 
Taken together, the layers of the global safety net total approximately 50% of the world's land, offering a blueprint to restore our biosphere, helping to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius and providing the ecosystem services vital to our survival. Over one third of these lands are communally held by indigenous peoples, which demonstrates the importance of safeguarding territorial rights for these communities. You can explore the global safety net through a new web application, which displays how every country and region can contribute in different ways towards this common goal. Visit gsnapp.org to learn more about your region and how it can contribute towards a world in which nature and humanity coexist and thrive together. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> so let's get into it. Um, Carly, it would be great if you could kick us off and talk to us more about the science behind the GSN and what it means for specific regions around the world. Happy to. Thanks so much, Justin. So I will take a few minutes to reveal the science that went into creating the maps um, that were shown in the film and to help you understand why as scientists, we were really compelled to go about creating this safety net. And hold on, because I'm gonna to try to summarize a two year scientific effort in a matter of minutes. So you've all likely heard of the Paris Climate Accord. Well, to date, no parallel agreement exists for biodiversity and species, but science and knowledge over the last decades has pointed to protecting half being our 1.5 degrees target. It's what's necessary to conserve life on Earth. And it's a target that's not just necessary, but really one that can inspire. Importantly, we believe that a Paris climate deal and a global deal for nature would be interdependent. Each are necessary for the other to be successful. Well, last year, we completed a synthesis of the science of what would be needed in a global deal for nature uh, to save life on Earth. And this was a holistic prescription and suggested the principles, milestones, and targets for what it would take. Nature is not evenly distributed on Earth. And so we can't just set a singular target for saving biodiversity. Regionally specific targets are necessary. And despite a myriad of efforts of global mapping from biologists, to date there was not a comprehensive single map that pointed of where we needed to conserve and protect half to save life on Earth and stabilize climate. So the global safety net, safety net analysis really started with the question, where do we need to secure vital habitats to stop the extinction crisis and stabilize climate? And while the global deal for nature encompasses the whole Earth, the global safety net is terrestrial focused. An accompanying effort is underway currently for the marine world realm, so stay tuned. <laughs> Um, we started with the existing network of protected area. These are places that already have formal designation that includes management for nature conservation. And then as you'll see, we began adding additional layers and data that had been developed for others. While satellite derived data is game changing in terms of being able to identify intact natural resources, this is not the same as understanding where species are. And so to map the last and best homes for rare species, we brought in species-driven data sets. The next si slide will show, for example, Alliance for Zero Extinction Sites, places on Earth that are the very last homes for rare species or single site endemics. So as you'll see on the next slide, this blue grass frog lives in one place on Earth. And fortunately, the areas hosting rare species are fairly well represented in the protected area system. But those that aren't shown, for example, here in Magenta for Northern South America are an extremely high priority for conservation, representing just 2.3% of the Earth's surface. They're also the last chance and an incredible opportunity to mobilize resources for these relatively limited but irreplaceable sites. 
Next, we layered in other analyses that had been done to identify centers of richness, like you may have heard of the biodiversity hotspots. But we used, many of you are likely familiar with Google Earth, we used the underlying data for that to identify habitat that was not yet converted or actively being managed for agriculture, excluding cities, to identify key areas that could still, still be conserved. And in building a map to represent rare species and sites of diversity, we acknowledge that many rare species are not range limited. Large mammals, for example, may have large distributions, but be naturally a rare, occurring in low densities wherever they're found. So to account for this, we brought in critically important landscapes. These places show where conservation efforts have been successful. And as an example, intact large mammal assemblages are places that remain today that still have the full roster of species that they had 500 years ago including the Pantanal of, of Brazil, one of the largest wetlands in the world that is largely intact. But this analysis also pointed to other areas that have been more converted, such as the Sahado biome, just to the uh, east of, of the Sahado of Brazil as being critically important. Here, a lot of land has been converted, but due to well-protected, albeit small, protected areas, as well as private land conservation mandated by federal law, these species such as Maine wolf, jaguars, pumas, giant anteaters, giant armadillos still remain. Importantly, large mammal assemblages also highlight, for example, as you'll see on the next slide, areas such as the boreal or tundra where large mammal assemblages remain, but also some of the world's greatest congregations and remaining migrations of species. These areas are also home to some of the most carbon rich lands on earth, which Protecting them means we can have a multitude of benefits. Large tracts of wilderness, shown on the next slide in blue, are a conservation priority in their own right. These lands are some of the most important places for indigenous peoples, some of the last strongholds for species, and also are critical for storing vast amounts of carbon. They are also vanishing quickly. When mapped, the interdependence of carbon and biodiversity is truly compelling. Together, the areas needing additional protection for biodiversity, shown here in blue shading, comprise 30.6% of the terrestrial realm. Protecting this amount of land also stores 1.3 trillion tons of carbon, which is cru crucial to climate stabilization. While this amount is substantial, believe it or not, it's still not enough. We thus used a map of total carbon biomass to identify additional areas that could receive designation, for example, as climate, climate stabilization areas. Providing these overlays shown here in orange and yellow, for example, and designating or enhancing their management for carbon storage could help unlock a necessary, necessary financing. Well, recent efforts have shown that connecting protected areas actually lags even far behind designating them. A corridor network is needed. So creating one is also an opportunity to help direct restoration and tree planting efforts. So in addition to assembling existing data sets, we conducted a global scale connectivity analysis. This demonstrated that a relatively modest amount of area could connect isolated fragments of nature together, increasing the resilience of ecosystems and our biosphere as a whole. When showing the full global safety net, it must be said that the contributions of indigenous land, lands overlap with at least 37% of the safety net. Recent papers have shown that biodiversity can be higher on lands managed by indigenous peoples than in nearby national parks. Lands managed by indigenous peoples, as this next point will show, can harbor as much as 80% of remaining biodiversity. Honoring the rights of indigenous peoples, helping secure land tender, tenure, and ensuring that where indigenous peoples seek to manage lands for conservation, they have the capacity and financial to support to do so will be critical to developing a global safety net for biodiversity and climate. 
Like with the Climate Accord, global targets and guidelines are important and may be helpful for driving action and resources towards global outcomes. We fully recognize, however, that the work of creating any safety net for life on Earth will be done by regional and local communities that do the necessary and challenging work of sitting down, looking at maps, such as you'll see in the next slide, and deciding if and how to designate lands for conservation. Our hope is that this global blueprint, the safety net, can be superseded over time with local and regional conservation plans as they become available. Until all regions of the world have such a process and supporting tool, the global safety net provides a common but differentiated approach for how countries can contribute to a global safety net. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Carl Burkhart, who's gonna walk you through some tools we've designed to help make this safety net accessible to uh, communities and governments. So I'm going to um, <laughs> walk you guys through the web application, which we built um, to uh, give everybody access to this data, which, um, was two and a half years in the making to compile. And um, so we worked with Google, the Google Earth team and uh, a firm visualization firm called Graphicsy to put this um, together. So I'm gonna give you a walkthrough so you guys will become experts at this and can share it with your friends and find out about the global safety net in your area. So um, I'm gonna walk you step-by-step step as a tutorial. The first one is to go, uh, and you don't have to do it now, and. We can uh, follow up with some notes, but the, go to the global safety net dot app. And that's um, where you'll find the web application. On the home page of the website, you, we have the video that we showed earlier. And on the top right here, you can see the navigation. So if you click on viewer, you'll be taken to this page here, which shows Europe right in the middle. Um, and that's the default view. Um, now I wanna point you to the controls here on the left, uh, we have boundary lines, which we'll talk about in a second, and then the global safety net layers, which Carly just walked you through. And you can see they have little check boxes next to them. So uh, it's defaulted that all of them are checked uh, and you can actually turn on and off different layers if you want. So you can um, see specifically um, different, different aspects of the global safety net. Um, one thing I do want to point out, uh, for example, in the pink area is that the global safety net was an additive compilation. So we did that to really call attention to areas that were not yet protected. So the pink areas are those species rarity sites um, that Carly mentioned um, that uh, the portions that are not yet protected. So there are, of course, many species rarity sites in the um, existing protected areas, which is the dark green area, but we highlighted the, the pink ones, um, which are the ones that are not yet protected. Uh, so let's, I'm gonna zoom in here and um, what you can do uh, with the controls and you can pan and zoom just like a normal app web application. Um, I wanna point you to the bottom here. There are three additional reference layers. We'll talk about those in just a second. Um, the blue one with the dark blue one, which is water is also turned on, um, even though that wasn't really part of our analysis. Um, now, so the what you can do if you wanna find out how the global safety net would add up for one country, um, you can uh, scroll to an area we're gonna pick here um, Congo, because it's a really important and very interesting country. Um, and you can see here the different layers. If you want to get the data, all you have to do is actually click on the country. And you'll see that the country outline gets highlighted in red. And then off to the right, this little information panel pops up. So the very top is the most important is the, uh, the global, the target for that country. So what part of the global safety net is in that country? And um, here we can see the target for uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is about 50%. Uh, it also shows the overlap with indigenous lands, which we um, think is very important to highlight here. That overlap is more than a quarter of those lands are indigenous territories. It also shows total carbon storage there. 
The last little thing you'll see on the right there is protection level. Uh, and that um, is something we'll talk about in a second. So you can actually pan over the bars. That box there shows the total area of the country visualized as a box. You can see, of course, most of the land um, or about half the land is gray, uh, which means it's, it's already developed. And then the different color bars here are the different parts of the safety net. You can also click on this display results as table and um, get a printable version of the data if you'd like. Um, now, I want to point your attention back to um, this top control on the left here, boundary lines. Um, you, can, uh, you can also uh, see, decide to look at the um, global safety net through the perspective of ecoregions, which are the 846 terrestrial regions, uh, which are um, unique assemblages of plants and animals. So. Um, if we select that, the, the application will zoom out. And now all those white lines are actually showing ecoregions instead of countries. So ecoregions, we kind of like to think of them as nature's countries or nature's states. Um, I just wanted to point just below that, uh, you can turn on the terrestrial eco ecoregions layer there if you want to get a visualization of what those um, different ecoregions are. And at the top, there's a little transparency slider. So you can kind of see what's beneath it. Um, so if we're interested in one ecoregion, we can actually now get the results. I'm going to move over here to Brazil. And um, the Amazon is this green area here. And you can see it's actually consists of many different ecoregions. So we're going to um, pick an area here in the Western Amazon. And it, once again, it displays that box, which shows for this ecoregion that's outlined here in red, what portion of that is in the global safety net. And here you can see almost all of it is essential for the global safety net. 92% of that area is important for biodiversity and carbon storage. Um, last, I wanted to um, show you that you can um, view this by United States as well. Um, and once again, if you click on that boundary line there, it'll zoom out. i um, going to just turn off the ecoregions for a minute. And now we're back on the states. So um, if you want to see what your state is, I know probably a lot of you are in California. Bioneers was, it used to be held physically in California. So we're going to use that one as an example. You can actually click on the US state and also get the target of the global safety net for the state. Um, and here, uh, we had some good news about Gavin Newsom announcing um, more, uh, a lot more protection for the state. And he announced a 30% protection target by 2030, which is a good start. But as we can see here in the global safety net, um, it's about 50% is required um, for California. That's land that's of particular importance for biodiversity and carbon storage. There's one other component I wanted to show you, I thought some of you might be interested here, uh, is this feature called rankings. And um, I mentioned here, like when we looked at California, we see that protection level of five. Um, so what we did is we actually ranked countries and states by this protection level. And you can get to that ranking by clicking on the rankings um, there. And uh, we have an interactive table that you can see. It's the default view here is set for countries. And I just want to quickly show you at the bottom, there's um, several lists. So we have large countries, medium countries, small countries. The EU is pulled out as its own grouping, and then USA as well. Uh, so you can click on USA, and you'll see all the United States ranked by their, they, they get a score based on their protection level. Um, the only one really that did very well was Delaware, uh, and um, that's a combination of it has actually a relatively small area, and a lot of that is protected. Um, so that is another feature here. And, and the reason we did this, um, especially for the, the large countries, which are party to the UN Convention on Biodiversity, we're really hoping that the Global Safety Net can contribute to a lot of other efforts that are also going on to really raise ambition for biodiversity, for protecting biodiversity. And there'll be a big meeting next year um, in Kunming, China, um, uh, that the United Nations is holding to um, re-up 
the biodiversity convention. So we're really hoping that this tool can help um, really increase uh, ambition because we have a lot of work to do to save um, nature and protect our climate. Thanks so much, Carl um, and Carly. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Oscar and Angela, um, who are going to talk to us about you know how how the GSN can help drive important policy change and the importance of upholding and strengthening indigenous land rights. Oscar. Thank you, everyone. And um, just it's an honor just to be here with you all. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a little bit about how uh, right now the Global Safety Net has been helpful for the civil society in what Carl already said, which is how are we going just to push for ambition in the next Biodiversity Convention, a conference of the parties that will take place in China. As you know, that would have the, the, the process should have started this year, but given the COVID-19, all the UN conventions and the processes has been pushed out for a year. So we already have the situation in which we already lost one year of action. So I'm gonna basically share this, um, how civil society has been somehow um, already working on on the process of, of, um, of getting the, the the process of the biodiversity in a way that um, we protect nature, uh, even though governments are not um, are not uh, yet having uh, or signal enough ambition um, to protect and to restore uh, nature. So, give me just one second. Bear, bear with me just for a minute. Um, there you go. Um, so. Basically, the presentation that I'm sharing today is about um, how how we are processing the, the resistant process, if, 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 if I might say. Um, one of the things that, um, if you see here, we basically, um, one of the things that we see, the, the beauty of the maps is that there are symbolic descriptions about the relationship between elements. And if you see in the map, I don't know if you, if you are seeing the map. Yeah, just you are seeing the map, you will see like a description about what happened just like yesterday, about how much uh, the Amazon has to be deforested. And you see the combination of New York, London, Shanghai. Uh, it's pretty um, a depressing picture, if, you, if I might say, but it also shows to raise awareness about the challenges that we have ahead. Um, but it's also it's about mapping about mission about vision and it's about how can we help with the maps uh, image in the world and this is a, a so a couple of pictures of retreats in which we use map to create that sense of belonging but also just to see what are the areas that we need to protect um in this context so therefore the the gsn um it's an amazing picture for us to check exactly what's going on in the world. But at the same time, we need just to see what is beyond the maps, the human stories, the conflicts, um, the, the dreams of the people like Joao, that he's been at his very young age combating the forest like his sisters uh, in the Amazon. So this is basically behind the map. We do see real people, uh, people that are doing something really concrete to protect nature right now, despite all the violation of human rights, despite all the um, aggressions that is upon indigenous peoples and local communities, there is resistance happening. So, and the GSN, how was useful for us? Um, the maps of the GSN has been a game changer for uh, the environmental movement, uh, even though it's already two months old. Um, so for us in Abbas, it gives us really a concrete information about where, which battles we have just to pick. For instance, the campaign that we are raising against Total in DRC uh, in Congo is actually has been inspired about the fact that the projects of oil projects in the Congo is based on areas that we need to protect based on the GSN, same in Indonesia, 
same with uh, with the deforestation uh, processes in in the Amazon. And and so and then we do have also. I'm just going to share very quickly how we also the civil society is helping to localize resistance through the GSN. So the 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 the, the, the dots that you are seeing is. Uh, areas in which you have projects and conflicts over natural resources and biodiversity. But also, uh, the GSN has been help us, helping us to organize our humanitarian aid on, on COVID-19, on, on the situation of the fires, of the fires, and as well in bringing advocacy response to, the, to different situations, especially at, at local level, because sometimes national governments are not having enough ambition, but that's different when we discuss uh, situations at local level uh, and beyond. And so mapping is about a big picture. Uh, and despite this is political will from governments, what we are seeing is like an, an amazing coalition of organizations that right now uh, are determined and inspired by the GSN to protect at least half of the planet in order just to restore uh, nature. And, and this is about being the dreaming big, and that's why uh, Avas and many other organizations are encouraging you to sign up for the global nature.org as a way to, to really get together. Because whether we are rich or poor, whether we live in the forest or in the cities, we have just one earth, and that is the place in which we need just to protect, uh, to imagine the world that we want. And one of the persons that has been doing this was Robinson Lopez Descanse, an amazing indigenous leader that he unfortunately died for COVID-19. And, and he did it as he was being part of the resistance, uh, stopping uh, oil projects in Colombia. So I want us just to have one minute of silence to, for him and to all indigenous peoples that has been fighting despite the COVID-19 for our heirs. Uh, and I think this is an honor to all the first heirs, first responders that are right now fighting in the front lines. If you join me, please. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this uh, tribute uh, to, to Robinson. And, and I think that we've been discussing a lot about indigenous uh, leadership, indigenous wisdom, and, and I think that this is the time to, 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 to listen to Angela. Uh, she is an, uh, an amazing leader from the Amazon uh, who's been in the front lines. Uh, in, uh, I think it's important in this specific context in which science is actually now uh, been very supportive of indigenous wisdom, even relig Western religions. So I think this is the time in which we need just to start listening to the wisdom of indigenous people. So it's an honor just to introduce Angela. Uh, so the floor is yours, Angela. 
Obrigada, Oscar. É, e a todos é um prazer muito grande é, de poder dialogar e entender o quanto a ciência ela só materializa aquilo que a gente vem defendendo durante séculos enquanto povo indígena. E eu fico muito feliz de, de escutar de que aquilo que a gente sempre alertou à humanidade sobre a, a importância de mudar os nossos modos de vida e está sendo materializado e provado por vocês cientistas. O que vocês apresentaram aqui não é nada diferente do que a gente vem discutindo, do que a gente vem tentando alertar a humanidade sobre a conservação e a mudança do modo de vida para que a gente tenha um planeta vivível, como é o tema deste painel. Thank you very much, Oscar, and thank you all uh, for the opportunity to have this dialogue where not only are we together, but we're here to show how much science supports all the efforts that we as indigenous people have made to fight against uh, climate change and other environmental crises. Uh, it's very important as a human uh, situation to change the way that we live our lives. And it's very uh, encouraging to see that scientists are only supporting our efforts even more. And uh, there's no difference in what the scientists are doing and what we are doing, which is to try to raise more awareness about the importance of protecting our planet so that we can have a planet that is livable in the future. E temos falado que a, a importância é, do reconhecimento dos territórios indígenas é, ela é primordial para que a gente consiga, de fato, reverter essa situação. É, no vídeo foi falado que é preciso deixar as áreas indígenas. É, na verdade, não precisa deixar nada, porque os territórios sempre foram os nossos e o que é preciso ter é que há um reconhecimento da importância daqueles territórios já existentes dos povos originários, não só do Brasil, mas de todo o mundo. E, infelizmente, a gente, é, no contexto do Brasil, que acredito que não seja diferente dos outros países onde há presença de povos indígenas, esse processo tem sido visto e tido como o um processo totalmente ao contrário, de que os territórios indígenas são uma ameaça para o tal desenvolvimento, é, que os territórios indígenas são atrasos, pro, são impedimentos e atrasos para os grandes empreendimentos. E a, durante muitos anos a gente tem alertado que esse modo né, de que essa, esse desenvolvimento tenta sustentar, ela é, na verdade, agressiva, não só para os povos indígenas. É quando você desmata, quando você é, tem as queimadas nos territórios, tanto em áreas protegidas quanto os territórios indígenas, ela não atinge só os povos indígenas, atinge todo mundo. Então, é uma responsabilidade muito grande de todos nós conseguimos é, é, entender a importância da presença dos povos indígenas, da presença dos territórios indígenas. Como vocês mesmos mostraram, que os territórios indígenas têm uma eficácia muito maior em proteção dos territórios, em, em manter os mananciais, em manter a biodiversidade do que as áreas protegidas. Então, o território como é, em si, ela não se protege sozinha. Quem protege aqueles territórios, aquela vida, aquelas, aquelas nascentes, somos nós, povos indígenas, que vivemos diretamente com a natureza. E, em adição a tudo isso, nós temos discutido a importância de reconhecer indígenas povos territórios em order to return or to turn back this situation. Uh, we must, uh, we've seen that the video said that we must leave the indigenous territories where they are. And uh, the issue here is that they already are ours. They belong to the indigenous peoples. What we really need is more recognition uh, that these are indigenous territories and that they are protected and that they belong to the indigenous peoples. Brazil, like in many other parts of the world, has seen that... Uh, people have 
taken a look at indigenous territories and they have perceived them as a threat to development, as an obstacle to larger projects of development. And we have sounded the alarm that this mode of looking at the indigenous territories is not only aggressive or an aggression against the indigenous peoples, but it's also an aggression against the forest and against the natural resources. And eventually that doesn't only affect us, the indigenous peoples, but it affects us all as a world and it affects all people and it affects the planet. And so we must have more understanding of the importance of indigenous peoples and their role in the world, as well as the, their ability to protect their territories. Uh, it was also encouraging that indigenous peoples uh, were mentioned in the video as being very effective when it came to protecting biodiversity and the conservation efforts in their territories. And so uh, we think that it's very important to protect not only the life that we have in those territories, but also the life that uh, we all are going to lead thanks to that kind of protection. É, e, e é necessário uma aliança para um projeto de, de que possamos manter o planeta é, vivível, o planeta possível de continuar vivendo, é, olhando essa importância e também assumindo uma responsabilidade de mudar o modo de vida. É, enquanto a gente demandar é, ao mercado a necessidade de ampliar o desmatamento para plantar soja, aquela soja que alimenta o, né, os animais que fornecem toda uma demanda, principalmente dos países da Europa, por exemplo, se a gente continuar é, não exigindo a rastreabilidade de produtos que vêm do Brasil, por exemplo, onde o Brasil é um dos maiores exportadores de produtos, né, que é de áreas de conflito, a gente vai continuar só discutindo ou só trazendo para uma sala de debate questões científicas, mas a gente precisa sair só do, da ação do discurso, precisamos agir e mudar o nosso modo de vida. É necessário cada cidadão, que cada pessoa né, no mundo inteiro mude sua forma de, de, é, de viver, de consumir, porque enquanto eu vê essa demanda, o, por exemplo, o governo Bolsonaro, que é totalmente anti-indígena, que está de, é, é, provocando e, é, o aumento do desmatamento, das queimadas dos territórios indígenas, diminuição de áreas protegidas, invasão dos territórios indígenas, vai continuar de uma forma forte, porque essa atitude é para atender a ganância, a ganância de uma demanda que vem de fora. Então, é necessário a gente poder enxergar isso e assumir essa responsabilidade. Nós, povos indígenas, somos 5% apenas da população mundial, mas protegemos 82% da biodiversidade. A biodiversidade ainda existe. Esses dados que os cientistas apresentaram né, de, de alguns animais ainda existem nos territórios, porque nós é, assumimos o compromisso de continuar protegendo. É necessário que o restante da população, da humanidade, assuma essa responsabilidade junto conosco, com o povo indígena, que a nossa missão de proteger os nossos territórios não é só para nós, é para toda a humanidade. E um dia que nós deixamos de proteger os territórios, a humanidade vai parar de existir, vai deixar de existir, porque o desenvolvimento ela passa por cima de toda essa necessidade de mantermos a biodiversidade viva. And in addition, or in, in addition uh, the alliance that we are setting up here is to help continue this life on our planet. And that will make it possible for our future generations to live in a healthy planet. In that sense, we need to change the way that we live our lives, uh, particularly when we see the situation where uh, deforestation is on the rise in order to accommodate the growing demand for soy, soy that eventually feeds the livestock that becomes dinner for people around the world. And so what we need to do is make sure that we're implementing the traceability of these products, particularly products that come from Brazil and areas of conflict in Brazil, conflict over biodiversity. So uh, we need to move beyond just having this dialogue in 
uh, these kind of spaces, we need action. And in that sense, uh, our leaders need to uh, see that we are helping the people of the world. And we need to find a way to get people to change their way of life. So this is the responsibility of each and every citizen in the world. Uh, we have a situation in Brazil where our president, President Bolsonaro, is anti-Indigenous people. He sets fires to the lands that we live on. He reduces the size of our territory. This kind of behavior serves only the greedy. And it's this greed that uh, serves the international markets that are selling the products that come from our lands. So we need to make sure that everybody sees our responsibility in this uh, situation. We, the indigenous peoples, are just a small fraction of the world's population. Nevertheless, we represent 82% of the protected areas of, for biodiversity. And we protect this biodiversity uh, because we have a commitment to the life around us. And we don't have it as a mission just for improving our lives, but rather uh, we want to support biodiversity so that we can not only help ourselves, but to help the whole planet to live a better life. Development as a as an agenda basically doesn't care about taking care of biodiversity the way that we do. Eu sei que já passou, só queria agradecer e dizer que a ciência e o conhecimento tradicional precisa andar junto e tem só existido para comprovar aquilo que temos defendido durante décadas. Muito obrigada. And I know that I'm over time, so I'd like to say thank you. And just one more time, repeat that science and traditional knowledge should work, walk hand in hand uh, to only continue showing that science and what we uh, have been defending for over many decades is very important and continues to uh, support each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela and Oscar. Um, it's such a rich conversation to be talking about um, you know, Western science and indigenous culture and, and rights and wisdom coming together. Um, and I know it's something that the, the Bioneers community is kind of right at, the, right at the edge of being able to move forward. So it's, um, it's just exciting to have this conversation today. Um, before I dive into a couple specific panel conversation, I mean questions, I wanted to invite um, the audience to use the chat function to start submitting questions. Um, in about 10, 15 minutes, we'll, we will pivot to taking questions from the audience. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from all of you. So um, the first question I wanted to throw out there specifically for, for Angela and for Oscar um, is, you know, just to make the point which you've heard before that indigenous lands contain 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. Yet in the past, there have been examples of governments using conservation as an excuse to take away indigenous lands. So my question for you all is, you know, how, do, how can we ensure that that doesn't happen? And are there cases where indigenous rights have actually been strengthened when governments acknowledge you know, that um, the, the role, the critical role that indigenous peoples play in actually protecting biodiversity. I will start as, as Angela get the translation of the whole question. Um, I think that, uh, well, first there are international mechanisms and there are international conventions that all the countries has signed it to protect indigenous rights. So I think that the first thing that God has to do is to respect those uh, international mechanisms that has been already in place. Uh, secondly, I think uh, it has to do a lot with the conservation community. Uh, there is, let's say, a monoculture within the conservation community in which has been somehow underestimating the effectiveness and the efficiency of indigenous communities and local, com and, and local communities in protecting uh, biodiversity. So I think that has to change. I think that is a space for listening more to indigenous communities right now. And, and I think that the third element here is uh, really strengthening indigenous peoples, indigenous leadership through finance, through uh, spaces like this in which their voice can be heard. And, and I think that is the, the key elements in which we have just to, to go because as Angela said, 
uh, in in her speech on this on the specific of Bolsonaro. Now we are actually going to a whole new level of indigenous of, of violation of indigenous rights, which is the institutionalization of those violations. Because Bolsonaro wasn't the first person that actually has violated indigenous rights, but he's institutionalizing us. We are entering into a trend in which now the conservation community has just to, for instance, follow the example of Sierra Club in recognizing some racisms, in, in recognizing the colonialisms, in recognizing that fortress conservation doesn't work anymore, and now is important to just reset and start listening. Thanks, Oscar. Angela, do you want to add in there? Sim, é, além disso, é, é preciso que o mundo todo possa nos ajudar a constranger e fazer com que isso, o, o governo Bolsonaro pare de atacar nossos direitos. E de que forma? O Bolsonaro só tem é, tentado é, violar nossos direitos, inclusive praticar é, atos inconstitucionais, porque existe uma demanda no mercado do fora do país. A partir do momento que cada país que compra produtos do Brasil tiver a responsabilidade de cobrar do governo Bolsonaro que aquele produto não venha dos territórios indígenas ou que não seja regada por sangue indígena, isso vai mudar o cenário. Então, a responsabilidade é de todos os países que consomem soja, milho, madeira do Brasil. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that we need to do is that we need to make people feel uncomfortable about their choices. And we need to help stop the Bolsonaro government from violating indigenous rights. All he has done from the very outset of his government is to violate our rights. And uh, there is a mo driver behind this. And that driver is the demand from, ab from abroad for Brazilian products. And so, if we ask our consumers to feel responsible and to make their leaders responsible for understanding where these products come from, to make sure that these products don't come from indigenous territories and that no blood has been shed, uh, no indigenous blood has been shed in order to produce these products, I think that that's going to be a major step forward and we need to take that kind of action. Thank you, Angela. Um, did anybody else want to add in here? I did want to just respond in saying that, um, you know, there's, there are, this is, this is a moment where we really don't have time. Um, we really need to, to pressure government leaders to do what's right. Um, and I think part of, part of the challenge that we have here is that there are so many folks in the world that are really truly kind of disconnected from understanding the earth and how it functions and nature. Um, and the real value um, that nature plays in, in supporting all of life. So part of this is, is a challenge of, of reconnecting to the earth, reconnecting to, to ancient wisdom. Um, and, you know, this is this clearly the Bioneers community is kind of a, a, the leading edge of understanding that. But thank you, Angela, for, for bringing that up. Um, I was going to pivot just because we only have a few minutes before we need to go to questions from the audience. I wanted to ask specifically, you know, Carl and and Carly and Oscar, um, since the release of the Global Safety Net back in September, you know, what has been the response? And is there cause for optimism that the global community is willing to adopt more ambitious biodiverse, biodiversity targets? And maybe to add to that, is there hope that we're going to start seeing the recognition of the role that nature plays in actually solving the climate crisis in international agreements like the Paris you know, Climate Agreement? And just a reminder to unmute yourself when you jump in. <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> Um, I mean, you can start with you know the response to the GSN thus far, and if you if you know how that has gone over the last couple of months. I know um, we've had. I, I believe there's been over a hundred articles written, um, and uh, and Oscar, you can correct me, but the quite a lot of coverage in um, Latin America, and a lot of journalists interested in in the paper, and we ended up producing, I think, something like. 30 or 40 specific country maps that zoom in the, and journalists were asking for these. In some cases they got printed. The Guardian did an article, Fast Company did an article. 
uh, we had a, um, there was a small CNN piece and then a piece just came out yesterday, Manga Bay, which is a nice walkthrough of it. So quite a lot of press and um, we're definitely making waves. I think we're making some people a little uncomfortable <laughs> because we're really calling out um, that the targets need to be much higher than what people think. And um, in particular, just we're hitting it every time that if we want to solve biodiversity and climate change, the number one, two and three thing we have to do is protect indigenous land rights. And uh, the UN convention has, has a sort of a, a observation group of, of indigenous people that's advising, but we, we need we need formal recognition we, of indigenous lands. That's the fastest way to save the climate, in my opinion. Thanks, Carl. Oscar, do, can you jump in and, and share a little bit about the international response by various countries um, in their local, you know, yeah. local regions and, and their response to the GSN? Yeah, I think that, uh, as Carl says, I think there's been uh, an unprecedented media coverage about the an interest. And of course, people were uncomfortable because of that, because in specific, the traditional conservation community has been pretty much looking into a lower targets. Uh, at the same time, we also have seen, and that was an experience in Abbas, we have just to translate uh, the article or part of the article in different languages, because indigenous communities, indigenous leaders, uh, other NGOs across in Africa or in Latin America, they were really interested about this, this tool. And, and I think that um, also local governments has been somehow recognizing and looking areas uh, of interest uh, of that. Uh, at the same time, also, I've been in touch with different delegates uh, in the Convention of Biodiversity, and they thought that this is actually very thought-provoking, which actually means that very that are very uncomfortable because right now there is some discussion a lower target, uh, and this is basically um, a scientific demonstration that targets needs to be higher and ambition needs to be higher. Thanks, Oscar. Anybody else want to jump in or should we move to the next question? I'll just add that, um, you know, Oscar is talking about the, the language starting to change in terms of higher targets. And it's, we really feel that um, this work and, and similar work has helped push the envelope in terms of the discussions that, whereas a couple of years ago, talking about protecting half or 50% is global protected area targets maybe seem laughable. Now, even if they're talking about lower targets, the language they're using is on the way to protecting half. And we're seeing even in the United States, um, you know, California now has um, an order to set, to ensure um, enhanced conservation and protection of 30% um, in the next 10 years. And uh, the next administration is likely to do something nationwide. So we're seeing movement kind of even at these country levels. And then finally, I would just say um, as, terrible as the situation with, with COVID has been. It's also showing the unprecedented way that governments can unlock funding when they see an emergency, which in some ways gives us hope for unlocking funding for climate and biodiversity emergencies um, and imagining all that could be done to mm -hmm. actually create the, the safety net. Thanks, Carly. That's a great point. Um, I know we need to move to the Q&A with the audience, but I had one quick one if we can squeeze it in, um, just because you mentioned COVID-19. Um, you know, it's clear that the climate crisis cannot be really isolated from the cause and the effects of the global pandemic. So I'd love to just quickly touch on, you know, how are the two, or how are the two issues connected? How can and can protecting wild areas for biodiversity also help prevent future pandemics? Carly, maybe you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, yeah, well, I guess like with uh, warnings about future pandemics that in retrospect, we look back and kind of see that people have been telling us that we should be preparing and expecting these. I'd say similarly, there's a body of research that has been done showing how um, the more that you have deforestation, degradation of environments, kind of breakdowns um, in particularly tropical forest areas 
and um, encroachment of cities, for example, wildlife markets, the more likely you are to have these crossover of zoonotic diseases. And so, um, you know, looking back, it feels like hindsight, of course, but there's a literature out there that shows us that um, actually protecting um, forests and ensuring we have healthy ecosystems is the best way to protect future global pandemics or prevent future global pandemics. Thanks, Carly. Um, I'm going a little bit off the plan, but um, we had an interesting conversation, Carl and I did with an indigenous leader from um, Mexico yesterday who was sharing with us the their indigenous perspective, his, his group's um, perspective on COVID-19 and, and you know, how, how they view um, what it means and why it's here. And I, I would love to kind of hear from Angela, you know, what she thinks, you know, I don't know how the, her perspective and um, on COVID-19. Infelizmente, é avassalador entre nós, povos indígenas, porque a COVID, ela veio e atingiu a, é, aquelas pessoas que, que têm mais importância dentro dos nossos territórios indígenas, pessoas que detêm o conhecimento e a essência do ser indígena, que são os mais velhos. Então, infelizmente, no Brasil chegou é, de uma forma muito violenta, é, fazendo que vários territórios foram, é, fossem atingidos, inclusive territórios onde há presença de povos falados e de recente contato. E, infelizmente, o governo só aproveitou esse momento difícil para incentivar a invasão dos nossos territórios. Tem sido ainda muito avassalador e muito triste aqui no Brasil. Yes, uh, well, unfortunately, in Brazil, it's been a very overwhelming situation, uh, and COVID has really had an overwhelming impact on indigenous peoples because it hit our peoples and particularly some of the most important people in our communities, which are the oldest among us. And uh, in Brazil, therefore, this disease reached us and hit us very violently. And uh, not only those of us who are in contact with the rest of the world, but also those who are voluntarily isolated, they have been hit by COVID-19. The government of Bolsonaro uh, used this uh, situation to only invade our territories. And this has only made the situation worse. And it's a very sad situation. Thanks, Angela. Um, you know, as evidenced by also, you know, Oscar's experience with Avaz and the network of, in, of indigenous groups that he's working with, um, and Robinson, who we, who he honored, and we all collectively honored earlier. Um, I need to move to the the questions from the audience, and there's a ton of really great ones, so it's a little bit tricky to pick <laughs> from all these amazing options, but. Um, up at the top, there is a question. It says, is it possible to add data for biodiversity, citizen, style, citizen science style? Um, he said his his area is northern Missouri. It's it's and isn't on the map. I'm guessing it in part is because it doesn't there's not enough data that has been gathered for that area. Um, so this might be a good one for Carl to address. Yeah. yeah, this is actually my favorite question because uh, there are something I didn't explain because we didn't want to get into the details, but the, the compilation of all of the many, many different data sets um, required a very fuzzy um, logic. So we had to make a quite large resolution, which is very blocky. And that was really to deliver the primary objective of the paper, which was the statistics. So where we could pull statistics for specific countries. But um, so it looks, it sort of weights um, existing regimes, which tend to um, weight very highly large or undisturbed areas. We know there is a ton of biodiversity of incredible importance in smaller pockets um, scattered throughout the world. And I love this question because my, my dream project is to um, work on a uh, citizen science um, platform, essentially, to allow people uh, to report 
areas of importance in their backyard or their community or and um, there's actually quite a few people working on this it's a hot topic and a really great question and so i would say watch the space we are coming out with a more refined global safety net um, hopefully towards the end of next year which will be a finer resolution so they'll, it'll pick up more um, but was we still to get to the really granular level we really have to we'll need the whole world really to participate in making that that map. Thanks, Carl. Um, so another one that just came up, I'm going to try to get to as many of these as I can. Um, it's uh, they asked, you know, how can we incorporate indigenous knowledge and biodiversity into our food systems, which is a great question, since we know that all of this you know, all of this overlaps, um, the protection of nature with with our agricultural systems, um, and then the piece around really acknowledging and supporting um, indigenous land tenure rights. Um, so I don't know who wants to dive into this, but the question is how can we incorporate indigenous knowledge and biodiversity into our food systems? Um. I could maybe, I'll just add a little note because I, I think maybe there's a translation time for Angela. Um, there, uh, there's a lot of very exciting initiatives. And um, if you go to our website, oneearth.org later, Justin will plug that. There's some cool projects there that are looking at uh, seed networks, um, which is one example of indigenous and uh, um, original peoples communities um, gathering together uh, banks of heirloom seeds there's another very cool project in, in the four, four Corners, Southwest area of the United States um, that elder women are working on a seed bank. So that's one way, I'm sure there's many, many others, but that's one to point out. Angela, did you wanna to add to this one? Sim, I think o que hoje a ciência comprova que é, que é possível um desenvolvimento sem desmatar. E, e esse conhecimento dos povos indígenas há muito tempo tem sido sustentado, que é possível viver em harmonia né, com o meio ambiente, com a biodiversidade e ter uma qualidade de vida. E isso a ciência de estar mostrando que é possível, que se a gente não, não considerar a existência dessa biodiversidade, não é possível ter uma qualidade de vida. Então, esse conhecimento tradicional com a ciência só vai é, ser comprovado e agora defendida pelos cientistas. Yes, I think that today science has shown that it is possible to have development without deforestation and uh, we can live in harmony with nature and biodiversity and have a better quality of life. Without biodiversity, on the other hand, we won't have any quality of life. So it's very important to have a mix of these two things together in order to uh, ensure better quality of life. Justin, I would just add, as a scientist who loves making maps, um, one thing that we can help do also is map what in the US are called first foods. So an initiative that I'm working on to make a global safety net at a regional level in the Cascadia region of Washington State and First Nations, um, the people there are telling us like, thanks for your biodiversity layers, thanks for your habitat layers, um, thanks for the information on carbon storage and please map you know, important areas for our first foods. So I think, again, like bringing in indigenous knowledge, really helping map and identify those areas that are important um, can be part of part of the solution. Thanks, Carly. Um, here is another one, and I did want to give a little bit of room right at the end of the panel for everybody to give a good call to action um, for how the the community that's watching us here today um, can engage on the GSN and on this you know larger um, effort. Um, but here is a quick question, which I think is a good point to clarify. Um, on the GSN map, can you please clarify the meaning of climate stabilization area? Carl, Carly? Let me start, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so climate stabilization area is um, really a term, so you can call them whatever you like, carbon storage areas, but really this was the concept that um, we recognize that we need 
at least half the earth protected and connected to meet these global biodiversity and climate objectives. And that um, the, the traditional kind of government uh, designated protected areas, like scaling that to 50% or more is, um, that will be part of the way we'll do things, but not the whole way. For other lands, and this is, you know, the question from Missouri or for small areas or community reserves um, or even government uh, designated lands that are currently managed for a multiple of uses, a designation like climate, stabiliza climate stabilization area could enable, um, in some cases, policy uh, change, in some cases, a management. So maybe a forest service goes from managing a given forest parcel for timber to managing for climate stabilization or carbon storage. And then it could potentially also be used to unlock um, additional financing that would essentially layer on and, and um, economize the natural capital of, of carbon storage and provide financial incentives for managing land those places. So it's a term we use to recognize that traditional protected areas, national parks, et cetera, aren't going to be the solution everywhere. And that in some places, um, a designation of, of a climate stabilization area could be used to essentially get the effective management that's necessary. Great. Um, thank you, Carly. So we only have a few minutes left. Um, I wanted to, I, this is going to be tough. We're going to see if we can do it relatively quickly, but um, do a quick roundup from each of you um, to share, you know, how viewers can get engaged in preserving Earth's biodiversity and, and also supporting indigenous rights. Um, you know, what is the best way for people to help make the, the global safety net a reality and to take action? Um, and I'd love to start with Angela. Assim, reconhecer o conhecimento tradicional e considerar dentro da ciência o quanto os dois conhecimentos são complementares. Eu acho que esse papel de vocês enquanto cientistas é importante para que esses conhecimentos que há muito tempo, antes da ciência inclusive já ter sido sustentado, é possível estar junto. E esse papel de vocês é fundamental, reconhecer o respeito pelos conhecimentos tradicionais. Yes, uh, basically, it would be to recognize the traditional knowledge and how science can be a complement to that traditional knowledge. This is fundamental because uh, our traditional knowledge has been around for a long time and your role is very important in supporting the knowledge that we already have by showing the scientific facts behind it. Thank you, John. Um, unfortunately, we have, you know, less than a minute, so I can't do what I wanted to do, but I'll just say, you know, please go visit the globalsafetynet.app um, to kind of explore the interactive data tool. Um, we'd also love everybody to sign um, and visit the Global Deal for Nature petition, globaldealfornature.org. Um, and, you know, a big thank you to all the panelists for being with us today. Um, and for everybody watching, um, I so wish we could have been together so that we could continue the conversation and have a late running panel. Um, but unfortunately, we have to wrap. So um, hopefully this is the start of many more rich conversations kind of bringing together indigenous wisdom and, and science um, and the collective action we all need to take together. So thank you so much. <laughs>